Hi, and welcome to Nexium on Trial. I'm Casey Seiler, the editor of the Albany Times Union, here once again with our own Robert Gavin to talk about the strange case of the purported self-help organization called Nexium, based right here in the beautiful capital region. Rob, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. Always good to be here. So we are now at 15 months after the conviction of Keith Ranieri, the man known within Nexium as Vanguard, and we don't seem to be running out of things to talk about, especially not in the last couple of weeks as we approach what might be termed sentencing season for many of the folks involved in Nexium who have either taken guilty pleas or, in the case of Keith Ranieri, been found guilty of all charges. And you've been reporting on these as they've been filed with the court. First thing we want to talk about is a lengthy recommendation from federal prosecutors to senior U.S. District Judge Nicholas Garalfis that um, came out uh, last Thursday. And I know you stayed up late into the night writing about this filing. Fairly remarkable, in which federal prosecutors reveal that Ranieri has been communicating with his followers and saying that he wants to, as they say, get scrutiny on the judge, that he feels that the judge is dead set against him and might end up putting him in prison for life. Yeah, I mean, it's almost as if you're watching Nexium over the years, as, as obviously we have at the Times Union, you would think that Keith Raniere has learned absolutely nothing from the past. If you thought that going through trial and being convicted might change the way Keith Raniere operated, the answer is no, by all accounts, based on this sentencing memorandum, which really is remarkable in that it shows Keith actually asking an associate by the name of, uh, and again, this is Sunil, Shaq Ravorti, who's a, a longtime Nexium, uh, you know, acolyte, and he tells him that on April 8th, this is from inside the uh, MDC jailhouse in Brooklyn, tells him. The federal it's a, lockup. It's a lockup where he's, he's, he's awaiting sentencing, and he tells him, <laughs> you know, not too much code here. What we have to do is get scrutiny on this judge get some pundit who was willing to speak out about what this judge is saying, which is crazy, and the judge needs to know he's being watched. And then he's, you know, the associate says, yeah. And then he says, by someone who is wise. And the associate says, yeah. And then what's even more bizarre is he then says, this is Keith Ranieri that says, so now we got to figure out the next step with Dershowitz. And of course, he's referring to Alan Dershowitz, who is the lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein, who is yet another very high profile sex trafficker, um, now deceased. Represented Epstein specifically more than a decade ago in his Florida state difficulties that did end up with him taking a plea bargain that subsequently, Jeffrey Epstein that is, the plea bargain was the subject of great criticism. The thing is about this is, Ranieri has a history of trying to get information on judges. Back in 2015, Times Union reported that Kristen Keefe, who was a former, she was sort of like the legal liaison to Nexium before she left the organization. She uh, had revealed that Nexium hired a Canadian company called Canaprobe to look through the federal records of six federal judges who were presiding over Nexium cases or cases with Nexium interests in them. So this is something that Nexium has done. They've uh, tried to get financial records on the quote unquote enemies of Nexium, which includes people at the Times Union, uh, as well as state senators the district attorney, U.S. senators. There's been a lot of high-profile people, including the late father of Claire and Sarah Bronfman. And of course, their number one enemy, which I would say their number one enemy in their minds was always someone by the name of Rick Ross, who was a cult tracker, so to speak, who ended up testifying at the trial. As yeah. fans of this podcast will know, um, we had a conversation with Rick Ross, a two-parter, and the second part of which just went up last week. But I just want to make clear before we move on from talking about Dershowitz that there has been no public indication that Alan Dershowitz has been involved in Ranieri's case. 
you reached out to his office and, and got no response, I assume. That's correct. I reached out, called, left messages, emailed. Obviously, Mr. Dershowitz is, is someone who's been very uh, a very public figure in the last few years through his support of Donald Trump and through his support, uh, I should say, his opposition and, and the defense of Epstein and that of everything that you know that involves. So an effort was made, never got back to me. I'll be waiting if he ever does return that phone call. This sentencing memorandum was really something. I mean, this this was in addition to the communications he had with Mr. Chakravorty. He had a phone conversation with Nikki Klein, who, if you are aware of Nikki Klein, she was an actress who was in the new version of Battlestar Galactica. She's also been identified as a first line. A uh, member of DOS, which is, of course, the you know the so-called master slave organization, which was basically a pyramid set up of women who agreed to do everything that their quote unquote masters told them to do, who then agreed to do what their quote unquote masters told them to do, and they were all quote unquote slaves. And she is someone who was very high ranking in that organization and is among the people who were, and currently, have danced outside Ranieri's jailhouse for him, which we reported on earlier this summer, dancing in rain or shine to support Ranieri and other members, I'm sorry, other inmates uh, during the coronavirus. But I mean, in letters and communications from inside the jail, uh, Ranieri has essentially continued to talk about DOS. He's continued to talk about these subjects, which are clearly, I mean, at one point he says that he was not a member of DOS. If you go back to the trial last year, he's on tape giving pinpoint instructions to Allison Mack of what to do with DOS. So I think we all know that that's not true, but there's a number of conversations. At one point he tells Nikki Klein, I believe the sorority is good, not just good and even noble, but great and vitally important for women and humanity. At another point, and you know, the Tanya Hajar, who is the federal prosecutor who wrote this filing, revealed that Ranieri wants his supporters to set up a podcast, which they will let almost anybody do these days, and set up a contest in which the public would be invited to find mistakes in his prosecution in exchange for a $25,000 cash prize. And I just want to point out, Rob, you were present for almost the entire trial. Nobody knows that testimony like you. You, unfortunately, are going to be barred from that kind of competition because you are a reporter, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a real shame. I was really counting on that $25,000. Every time during this case, if you thought that it couldn't get stranger, you were always quickly shown to be wrong. And this is just part of it. Wanting to put up a podcast in exchange for a $25,000 cash prize, as well as uh, referring to his arrest in Mexico as a quote unquote kidnapping. I think he called it a purely political envy driven money powered lie to destroy a community. I mean, this is this is something you have to see it to believe it, but that's been the case with Nexium. You know, there everything in Nexium has been something where is it, you know, you say, well that can't be true, and then we find out that it is true. So this is something where is the end of the day, the prosecution is asking Judge Senior Judge Nicholas Garafis to sentence Keith Ranieri to prison for life. That's not a surprise. I don't think anybody who covered this trial should be surprised at that recommendation. Um, they're asking for a life sentence. Even if the judge were to not give a life sentence to Keith Ranieri, he just turned 60, it's going to be a very significant prison sentence. And you have to think, at this point, it would be a shock if Keith Ranieri was not given a life sentence. So someone who is facing considerably less time, but whose sentencing is coming up about a month before Ranieri is coming up on September 30th, the sentencing of Claire Bronfman, who you mentioned before. 41 years old, longtime associate of Keith Ranieri, along with her sister, probably the most deep-pocketed longtime supporter of his. You reported earlier this week that her defense team filed with the court a long letter essentially offering a bit of apologia without an apology, I guess you might call it. And she wrote, among other things, through my many years with Nexium, I started to enjoy life, to feel accepted, loved, and happy. 
Subsequently, many members of the community, the Nexium community, became like family to me, and I cannot find it in me now to turn my back on those friendships, nor deny how profoundly Keith and Nexium impacted my life, even though some of them have now been labeled as bad for remaining friends. I experience them as some of the most kind-hearted and well-intentioned people I know. Yeah, there is, if you look at the letter Claire wrote, and there was about 60 letters of support in addition to a sentencing memo written on behalf of her new lawyer, Ronald S. Sullivan Jr. Claire Bronfman in no way disavows Keith Ranieri. She stands extremely loyal to him. There are apologies, but you know, the closer you look at her letter, you wonder, well, what are you apologizing for if you don't see anything wrong with what Keith did? And even uh, defending Das. And at one point, she has, uh, you know, said many people, she actually said this, many people, including most of my own family, believe I should disavow uh, Keith and Nexium and that I have not as hard for them to understand or accept. However, for me, Nexium and Keith greatly changed my life for the better. I think the fact that she's now facing 21 to 27 months in prison and, and possibly more might show that that's not necessarily the case, but there are a lot of possibilities here that could happen at this sentencing. The judge has, has agreed to consider an above guideline sentence for Claire Bronfman, which means she could get more time than that. Her lawyer wants her to get three years probation. It's almost like there's two separate people here, depending on whose version of events you see. There's, there's the version we heard in court um, and what we've known based on evidence and, and what we see in which Claire Bronfman was a clear supporter of, of Nexium and, and member. And her new lawyer has, has essentially really tried to distance her from any of the crimes in Nexium, as well as certainly DOS, which should not be forgotten. She had said she was trying to re, no pun intended here, she wanted to re uh, a brand uh, Das and was part of that. So there were involvements between Claire and Nexium. And in fact, uh, she, as the judge had said at an earlier hearing, she was uh, writing a lot of checks. And it should, we should be clear that Claire Bronfman has pled guilty to uh, conspiracy to conceal and harbor illegal aliens and, you know, illegal alien as well as uh, fraudulent use of identification. So again, you know, September 30th, Claire will be sentenced, but if you thought that, you know, her pleading a guilty was going to be somehow a rejection of Keith Ranieri, it's not. And you got to wonder what that does to the judge. If, on one hand, you're trying to say through your lawyer and yourself, I have nothing to do with this organization's crimes. Uh, I had nothing to do with Keith Ranieri's crime, but you're not turning your back on him. And then meanwhile, I mentioned 60 letters came in, right? Well, a number of those letters are from, uh, I mean, at least 20 people who are currently or past members of Nexium, members of DOS, including Daniel Roberts, who was the doctor who actually engraved Keith Ranieri's initials into the pelvic regions of women. She wrote a letter on behalf of it. Nikki Klein, someone the judge knows is, was a member of DOS. She wrote a letter on behalf. So it's this situation, you know, I kind of equate it to like, let's say it was, you know, you know, the mob, well, I had nothing to do with the mob. And then Polly Walnuts and Tony Soprano and four other, uh, you know, members of the Sopranos write letters on your behalf. It's just, it's a very bizarre situation there where you have members of DOS writing on your behalf as you're trying to distance yourself from DOS. Uh, there's also some other letters in there from her mother, from her sister. Her mother actually was very specific to say that, that she was was very unlike her daughter to become involved with a man like Ranieri. So clearly she's not a supporter of Nexium. But most of the of the people on there who write, there's a number of people on there. I saw one person on there, a number of people who sort of downplayed the crimes, people pointing fingers at the media and the court or other things other than Keith Ranieri. But, you know, I, I think it's it, it just screams, it comes right at you that Claire Bronfman is, standing very much with Keith Ranieri even now. So all of this is going on as HBO has debuted its new documentary series, The Bow. I have a vision of what it could be like to be a human. We've now seen the first two episodes. So as a, a former entertainment writer, I of course wanna, <laughs> wanna serve up my opinion, but I wanna get your sense. What do you think of it so far? 
if you watch the first episode, it was very sort of slow. And, 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 and that's not a criticism. It's just you're like, oh, wow, you know, where's this going? And then at the very end, they showed the beginning of the darkness. Like they showed why people might be attracted to, to Nexium. They interviewed Sarah Edmondson, whose story really is what got DOS exposed, uh, who was a member of DOS out of Vancouver. They interviewed Mark Vicente, someone I've spoken to a number of times. He testified at the trial, a very high ranking member of Nexium, and they interview him. And they show like what would be the appeal, why people wanted to go into this organization. And at the very end of that first episode, Bonnie Peace, who is Mark's wife, and if you're a Star Wars dork like myself, is also Aunt Beru uh, in the new Star Wars movies. So the prequels, right? The prequels, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. She's in the prequels. Come on, Rob. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's the it's not the new ones. It's it, it is the prequels, and then you go to the second episode, and the second episode I thought took a real turn, and it's focused mostly on Bonnie and her experience and how she's trying to get Mark Vicente to realize. It's an interesting way that they sort of showed you how people might be attracted, and now they're just showing you the uh, beginning of the darkness. So for someone who covered the trial, I found it really interesting to watch. Uh, you know, I'm someone who's spoken to Mark Vicente and Bonnie Peace. The thing that's really incredible is that Mark Vicente tape records all his phone calls, and you're hearing those phone calls like they're reenacted but they're the actual phone calls so it's a very very interesting and unique way to watch a documentary it's almost like it's happening in real time because you're hearing these these recordings and i like i say it said the, the last time i was on here i i'm not having popcorn but i'm i'm there every every sunday at 10 o'clock i kind of can't get enough of it it's remarkable it's well worth watching it is amazing how much footage and material they have it shows the benefit of having the assistance of Mark Vicente, who was essentially, he was a Boswell, you know, uh, to, to Keith Ranieri, following him around with a camera, taping everything, which of course Ranieri encouraged his followers to do as if everything he said was almost holy writ. And you discuss the recordings, there's a recording in the second episode in which Mark Vicente is on the phone with Sarah Edmondson, I believe, talking about DOS. They're kind of very carefully trying to sort of feel each other out on what they know about the situation. And Edmondson says, well, you're not recording this, are you? And, and he says, I record everything. <laughs> but I, of course, am very interested in what these people thought of what the rest of the world knew about Nexium while they were living through it. And there's nothing of that. You know, there's nothing about I'm thinking, of course, of the Times Union. There's nothing about the Times Union's coverage of Nexium, which goes back more than a decade, including like a major 2012 yeah. um, expose that Jim O'Dotto and Jennifer Gish wrote. And you just want to kind of shake Mark Vicente and say, did you ever do a Google search for, for Nexium?" And of course, it's intentional by the filmmakers to do it from within the mindset of somebody who is within that organization, their attitudes their faith, their understanding is all completely stovepipe within the community. And it's extremely claustrophobic for the viewer, especially the viewer who knows um, as much about Nexium as weirdos like you and me do, but it's really effective in showing you what it's like to be within an organization like that. Yeah, I mean, it really is. During the trial, I had asked myself that question over and over again. You see things in 2014, 2015, 2016, and I would always just go back to, you know, the Times Union has been writing about Nexium since 2003 and Secrets of Nexium was 2012. And it is astounding to think that there was so much information out there that was either ignored or, as we know, Keith Raniere had instructed members of Nexium that, you know, the press, we were at many levels enemies of Nexium, according to them. So, you know, they didn't read, uh, uh, what we had to say, or if they did, they disregarded it. And, and you're still seeing that, I think, in some of the letters from people supporting Claire Promptman. I think you'll probably see that when letters come in for Keith Raniere, uh, if they do come in. The, the reality is that so that's how a lot of cults work. When they you hear people talk about it, it's don't look at that over there. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying, not what anyone else is saying. Uh, because, yeah, if you read those stories and you paid a lot of attention to what we were saying about Keith Raniere and what we were reporting about him eight years ago, what 
and more than eight years ago, this would none of this would really surprise you that much. Some of it's going to surprise anybody because it's just that bizarre. But the basic facts that there was some cult-like activity going on, that was not a surprise. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody unless you've been living in a cave or living within the world of Nexium. Well, leave it to the journalists to say, why isn't there more stuff about us in there? Well, thanks very much, Rob Gavin. I really appreciate it. I know you'll be on top of this story and, and so many others. So great talking to you once again. Yeah, happy to be here, as always. And to our listeners, please remember that our investigation and ongoing coverage of Nexium and other important stories in the Capital Region is supported by subscribers to the Albany Times Union. If you live around here, please remember to support our work. And if you live elsewhere around the country, please remember to support your own local journalists. Thanks very much for listening to this episode of Nexium on Trial. Once again, I'm Casey Seiler, editor of the Albany Times Union.